Hi, my name is Nathaniel Campbell, and today I'm going to be talking to you, with you, about Hildegard's understanding of the created universe, and specifically the way that all of creation, including us, is interconnected within God's plan. Let me introduce myself first. I'm a medievalist and I teach history at Union College, a small school in Barberville, Kentucky. I'm also the translator of Hildegard's Book of Divine Works. Uh, this book was published in uh, 2018 by the uh, Catholic University of America Press. Uh, it's the first full and complete English translation of this work uh, to appear, and there will be a link to the publisher's website uh, hopefully posted in the comments. And this book, the Book of Divine Works, is important for our topic because it represents Hildegard's fullest and most mature treatment of her understanding of the universe and our place within it. It's also the capstone of her visionary trilogy uh, with Sivias and the Book of Life's Merits or the Rewards of Life uh, coming before it. It was sparked by a series of mystical experiences in the 1160s. Hildegard says that it was as if the inspiration of God were sprinkling drops of sweet, sweet rain into my soul's knowing. And the first fruits of that spiritual understanding was insight into the meaning of the prologue to John's gospel, that first 14 verses that begin in the beginning was the word. This is what uh, Hildegard wrote about that as a summary of what happened. It was the word which before all created things had no beginning and after them shall have no end, which summoned all created things into being. In this way, what was predestined by him before ever the world was, appeared in visible form. Therefore, man, or humankind, is the work of God, along with every creature. But man is also said to be divinity's worker or agent and a shadow of his mysteries and should in all things reveal the Holy Trinity for God made him in his image and likeness. So this book, uh, this her third book that Hildegard called the Book of Divine Works but when she thinks about the work of God, she thinks first and foremost about us, which means she's tackling here a question that I frequently put before my history students too. The question of what does it mean to be a human being? For Hildegard, though she of course drew on her, at this point, many decades of experience um, as a religious woman and a leader of religious women. For Hildegard, to answer that question, she looks to precisely one place. She looks to the incarnate word, to Jesus Christ. And by looking at him, perfect God and perfect human being, this leads her then back to the heart of the Father in eternity. The incarnation is at the center of everything for Hildegard. Everything that God has done, everything that he has made, has been for this singular purpose, to prepare, prepare for God to enter into creation, for God to become a human being. The perfect ordering of all that exists, 
which God foreknew before ever it came into existence, that God knew ahead of time. It reaches from the outermost edges of the cosmic spheres, the edges of the vast universe, down into the very smallest of organisms. All of it is ordered on behalf of, and therefore within humankind, precisely because that human form was one day to contain divinity to contain God himself. This is what it means for Hildegard to be made in the image and likeness of God. She explains this extensively in the second part of the Book of Divine Works, which is her, cre her commentary on the creation story, the first chapter of Genesis. And she explains that the image of God in which we are made is what she calls the garment of the incarnate word, the garment, the clothing that God took upon himself. And this garment, this clothing of for God, the human form, was predestined by God's ancient counsel or ancient plan. God fully intended to become a human being from eternity. It was always a part of his plan. Then there is the likeness, because we are made in the image, that's the body, and there's this likeness to God. For her, that is our rationality. It's the same rationality of the word by whom all things were made. So, we have a rational vocation to be creators, just like God. And we have physical bodies that allow us to interact with creation, to do God's work with it. Which means that everything that exists is ordered for us to do God's work. Here's one way that Hildegard uh, summarizes this in the second vision of the Book of Divine Works. God, for the glory of his name, gathered together the world out of the elements, strength, strengthened it with the winds, stitched it together and gave it light with the stars, and filled it up with all the other creatures. With all these things in the world, he surrounded and fortified humankind and everywhere imbued them with the greatest strength so that creation might assist him in all things and partake in all human works so that they might do their work with creation. For humankind can neither live nor even exist without creation. This is a profoundly anthropocentric vision. That means humankind stands at the very center of creation. As Hildegard sometimes says, humankind is all of creation or every creature. But this centeredness, if you can think of it that way, also comes with a responsibility. It does not mean that we are free to do with creation whatever we would like. Instead, it means that we must act with creation in accordance with, to fulfill order for it. This might make a little bit more sense if we begin, if we look at one of the famous illustrations that was produced a few decades after Hildegard's death to go with the Book of Divine Works. This is this uh, famous image of the human figure standing astride the cosmos. What you see is the entire universe 
held within these red arms of divine love. And it has these bands, these spheres of uh, fire and ether, what we would think of as outer space, and then air, atmosphere, and then here in the middle, the earth. And here, the human figure standing in the midst of it all. But you notice that there's not just the human figure. There's a lot more going on here. You'll notice, for example, all of these lines that crisscross this image, creating a web of hold, holding it all together. These lines represent beams from the stars and the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the five planets that were known in Hildegard's time. Hildegard says that the stars are like nails holding together the wall, right? The stars hold together the cosmos. Then you'll also see these interesting animal figures, and they're a little easier to see if we go to this other image that goes with the third vision in the manuscript. These animal heads represent the winds. And for Hildegard, the winds, this network of winds is part of what, another part of what keeps the whole universe together. Now, uh, I wanna tell you a little bit of a story here. Um, the first week of September, the first few days of September where I live in Southeastern Kentucky, we had very unstable weather. And that happens a lot when we get a lot of humidity in the air. A lot of heat and humidity makes the air very unstable. And I was out one morning with my kids in the yard. We were desperately trying to play Frisbee and have as much playtime as we could before the storms that we could see were coming arrived. And we were getting these huge gusts of wind. And my son grew frustrated because it kept blowing the Frisbee away. And he said, Dad, I wish we could just control them, make the wind stop doing this. So of course I had to explain to him that no, we can't control the winds. The winds have their own energy. They are the energy of the atmosphere. Um, to explain it to him, I said, you imagine that the, you can think of the air as being excited. And that makes sense to a kid being excited. Excitement makes you make you move, right? And the excitement in the air wants to make the air move with these gusts of wind. And the thing is, this idea of a lots of energy with the winds, that's exactly what Hildegard understood the winds to do as well. The physical function of the winds, Hildegard understood, was to transmit energies from the cosmic spheres into the atmosphere and thus to the earth to preserve the things that are in the world by tempering them. So what the winds do is in places that are too hot, they'll bring coolness. In places that are too cold, they'll bring heat. Places where it's too dry, they'll bring moisture. In places where it's too wet, they'll bring drought. The function of the winds is to try to keep everything in balance with in, in a balanced set of energies. That physical interaction extends to humans, too, to impart energies to our bodies, but also to awaken our minds to the vast web of creation to which we are thus connected. Okay, we are physically connected to the universe. Creation exerts a pull on us, and we, in turn, have an effect on the world around us. But this idea of this network of winds transmitting their effects into the world, of the world breathing, this respiration of creation, it also has a moral meaning for Hildegard. She imagines this also being the respiration of the virtues. So the moral function of the winds is to admonish us to keep our fear of the Lord that's the east wind, to beware of the punishments of hell, that's the west wind, and the judgment of God in the south, to be pricked by bodily distress from the north wind. 
But the winds also support us in their moral meaning with breaths of faith and trust, gentleness and patience, holiness and constancy, all amidst the ups and downs, the prosperity and adversity of life. Hildegard understands the entire physical universe to act like a sacrament. A sacrament is a physical thing that has spiritual force and effect, what we sometimes call grace. But Hildegard tends to use the word virtue. Each and every outward and visible element of the universe points to an inward and spiritual meaning. So it's not so much an allegory by which Hildegard visualizes each wind having a corresponding virtue breathing onto each human person. Rather, the pattern of virtues is an inherent created property of the network of winds. They're supposed to communicate that spiritual reality to the soul. That's what God created the winds to do. It's cause the, the universe's cosmic, human, and spiritual elements are all meant for Hildegard to be united in their relationship to God. And for one purpose to prepare for God to exist within creation, to become a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. But our relationship to God and to his son, Jesus Christ, is often broken, both physically and spiritually. We are on this pilgrimage virtually this year because we find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. Pope Francis has repeatedly connected this pandemic's effects to our global, global climate crisis and to the pressing need for ecological stewardship for caring for our creation. Hildegard would, I think, entirely agree with his assessment. As her heavenly voice declared in her third vision in the Book of Divine Works, God made all parts of creation in both the upper and lower realms and directed them to be useful for humankind. But, if humankind perverts them with corrupt actions, the judgment of God brings creation down upon them with vengeance. So, I want to close with a special prayer I've composed for this season of pandemic and pilgrimage. It is in the form of a chronogram which means that in its Latin form, all of the letters within it that are also Roman numerals add up to the number of our year, 2020. I've also posted this prayer on my blog. Hopefully a link to that will also be available in the comments. Let us pray. O luce viventi coronata, Cuius vox quasi toni trui nos de languora nostru, in salutem roborat. Ora pro nobis, et pro egra orbis etati nostri. In English. O one crowned with the living light, whose voice as of thunder strengthens us from our weakness into health, Pray for us and for this ailing age. Amen. <laughs>